Thank you for joining us in today's webinar, Lambs Alive, Increasing Lamb Numbers and Survival. Um, I'm Jodie Rizzae O'Brien and I'll be co-hosting tonight's webinar with Ian McFarlane. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Just like to acknowledge the funding um, the Sheep Connect um, receives from Australian Wool Innovation and also from the Sheep Industry Fund of South Australia. If you would like more information about Sheep Connect, you can go to our website, sheepconnectsa.com.au or follow us on Twitter at Sheep Connect SA. Just want to bring to your attention a couple um, of upcoming events. One on selecting rams on the 28th of July, which will be presented by Michelle Cousins, and one with Ben Swain on sire evaluation in South Australia in August. We'll keep you posted of that date. We also have some Winning with Wieners workshops coming up, one tomorrow at Truro, and then three on Air Peninsula in August. Please contact us at um, Sheep Connect if you're interested in those events. Tonight's webinar um, is going to be presented by Dr. Colin Trengrove. Colin's the Director of Ag Pro Ag Consulting um, and he's also a guest lecturer at the School of Animal and Vet Sciences at the University of Adelaide. His studies were originally in rural science and then vet science from Murdoch University in Perth in Western Australia. His main interests are focused around production, animal health, nutrition and management stemming from his involvement in his family property um, with beef, sheep and cropping in, at Spalding in the mid north of South Australia. I'll um, let Colin present tonight's webinar. Thank you, Colin. Okay, righto. So increased phlegm numbers and survival. So obviously very topical. Now I imagine uh, a few of the people listening may be already well into lambing or per perhaps finished lambing. So uh, I'd like to perhaps cover the whole gamut going from how to get lamb numbers in the first place and then how do we make sure they survive after birth. So uh, hopefully there's a bit in it for everyone uh, who's listening. So the, uh, <coughs> now these are old figures, but unfortunately they really haven't changed much. But um, so the current situation is uh, na national average of about 80% lamb vary from region to region. And in some regions, it's probably closer to 90 to 100%. But in other regions, it's going to be well under 80. And uh, that's looking uh, long term. It's necessarily relating to the last 12 months, of course, which um, you know, everyone's figures have probably been down in the last 12 months. Uh, the next point is that a third of lambs are lost, uh, generally uh, between the joining to weaning period. And 70% of these losses occur in the uh, first two days or 48 hours after lambing. The, uh, but uh, once you get to marking or generally, uh, or weaning, um, most, most of them manage to survive for the next 12 months. So it's really the critical period is that first uh, 48 hours after lambing is where most lambs are lost. So how do we improve reproductive performance? So there are a number of uh, different strategies you can adopt and uh, this slide will just summarise uh, some that we'll go into in more detail uh, during the next uh, 30 or so minutes. So increasing conception rates is certainly uh, a major factor in terms of getting lambs uh, at least conceived and uh, that uh, involves better ewe nutrition from the pre-joining period. Uh, certainly genetics has played a role in that and also obviously um, Sometimes the uh, forgotten factor is the ram, and so examining the ram at least a couple of months before joining to ensure that they are fit for purpose. Now, this is just not a uh, physical appraisal; it's um, a close inspection and palpation of their of their testicles, uh, as well as their soundness in terms of movement, etc. So we call it the four T test, which is the uh, teeth, their toes, their testes, and their tussle, being a euphemism for their um, penis and prepuce. But that's another story, which um, I see um, uh, probably Michelle Cousins will be covering that off in her workshop coming up. Uh, the next aspect here is increasing lamb survival. And uh, so the Lifetime Ewe Management Program, for example, is all about uh, targeting ewe nutrition during pregnancy. Uh, and uh, you can do this by monitoring ewe condition and the amount of feed on offer and then doing feed budgeting during the the pregnancy and lactational phase to ensure that the ewe is uh, getting the required amount of energy and protein to meet their needs. And then the next point there is uh, scanning for twins. So 
so that we can ensure that uh, the, uh, I guess, the ones that have the biggest influence on reproductive rate, in other words, the ewes that bear twins, that they're going to be getting a suitable amount of energy to ensure survival of both themselves and the twins. The third point here is once we've got the lambs on the ground, is to ensure that they stay alive. So increasing um, survival through to weaning and then beyond. And so we might target, for example, a very modest um, 25 kilograms weaning weight. Uh, now, a lot of uh, large frame merino producers will be probably getting anything up to 10 kilograms heavier than that at weaning. Uh, and then the next point is that over the summer period, when obviously um, it's expensive to feed, uh, if you've got self-replacing lambs, uh, self-replacing flock, you just really need to maintain those weaners at a growth rate about one kilogram uh, gain per month to ensure that uh, they have a good chance of surviving. So getting back to scanning, so why do we scan? Now this uh, somewhat old graph here is a, is a good illustration. So if we look at um, the bottom point for a start, so the um, fertility, for example, uh, so fertility, you'd normally expect around about 90, 95% of the ewes to get in lamb during a six-week joining period. And uh, so this is the number of ewes uh, pregnant from the total number of ewes joined. Now, that, that's, a, that's, I guess, a given, unless you've got some uh, disaster going on where you may not achieve those sort of rates. But you really need to scan to know uh, what the potential lambing rate is. So if you go to the next curve here, we see that... Um, the reproductive rate, which is the number of lambs per use joined. So that's obviously taking account of the ones that are uh, basically dry and also the ones that have got singles and then, of course, the ones that have got twins or triplets. And then the, uh, the next level here is showing the uh, prolificacy. Uh, and so this is really the uh, number of lambs per pregnant ewe. So obviously, in this case, we've taken the dry ewes out and so it's the uh, total number of ewes that are bearing either single twins or triplets. Now, all this information is unavailable unless you do scanning. And so you don't really know what the potential lambing rate is unless you've done scanning. So we see that is really, if you're trying to lift reproductive performance in your flock, you really do need to be doing scanning on a routine basis. Now, I've got uh, just showing some data here from um, a project that's going with the uh, the Elmore sheep breed comparison trial, which has been running since 2015, uh, and this is into its final year. Now, this is uh, I just use this to, as an illustration of perhaps the benefit of of scanning, and also the um, I guess the lamb loss that occurs between scanning through to uh, lamb marking. So here we have a uh, number of different breeds. So we have the Border Lester with a merino cross, uh, multi meat uh, cross with merino cross, uh, composites, in this case the cashmore and uh, then we have three different uh, bloodlines of merinos. Now this trial was very well set up, uh, basically taking hoglets from three different properties that had these bloodlines and uh, so there's about 50 odd uh, sheep contributed from each of the, the uh, three donor commercial properties. Uh, it was set up um, in 2015 with the first lambing in 2016. And we see here that at this stage, um, the ewes are roughly about one and a half years of age or a bit older. Uh, and similar conditions, of course, these are all being run effectively under the same conditions, same environmental circumstance at uh, Elmore, Elmore, which is around about a 460 millimetre rainfall uh, in central North Victoria. And uh, we see here that um, effectively the I guess the multi meat or the crossbred composite type ewes were around about the 60 odd, 60 to 70 kilos in their first um, 18 months, whereas the uh, merinos were more close to two, were around about 55 kilos. Now, the results um, here of the uh, first scanning through the lambing. So we see here that um, the pale blue is the preg scan rate. Uh, so preg scanning was on the 20th of April. Uh, the Next shade of blue is the uh, lambs born, and then the darker shade is the uh, lambs marked. So it's just interesting to look at some. Um, there's you know, three uh, different, I guess, primarily uh, prime lamb breeds here, and then we've got three merino breeds. So if we just look at the um, lamb loss between scanning through to lamb marking, so 
So we see here we've got a 50% loss. Uh, here with the multi meets, there was 110% loss. And uh, with the composites, 64% uh, loss. So it shows some, um, and it's not perhaps unusual that um, we do see this significant loss of lambs, uh, basically from scanning through to uh, lamb marking. From the uh, Merino, the different bloodlines here, we see um, around about a 30 to 40 odd percent loss uh, with the, um, once again, from scanning through, through to lambing. And so these uh, figures are not uh, dissimilar to what we might see in industry in terms of um, there's always going to be a significant loss between uh, scanning through to marking. And uh, we're doing some further studies on that in a more intensive uh, method at the, at the moment. So if we move on and look at the, um, these results graphed, now if we firstly just focus on the black lines here, so these black lines are indicating from a study in the 1970s where they bought less than Merino U, and uh, depending on the lambing date as to what sort of reproductive performance we're getting. So if we say um, <clears throat> with a May lambing, um, obviously these are being mated in late or basically November, December. And uh, as a result of that, that's not really the ideal time to be made in used to get the best reproductive performance. So as we move through to a later lambing, June, July, and then August, we see that um, the uh, number of lambs born per ewe joined goes up. And that's to be expected because it means that these ewes, either in the June through to August joining, are actually more attuned to the ideal uh, or the optimum reproductive performance of those ewes. So you're going to get more multiple births occurring. The other thing we see here that as the ewe weight goes up, that there is also an improvement in the uh, number of lambs born per ewe join. And once again, we've always known that um, reproductive rate is body weight uh, responsive. And so if you're really optimised, trying to optimise um, the number of lambs born, you go for obviously a a bigger U uh, with a later joining in that late late winter period. If we look at uh, the firstly the three merino types here, we see here that they are roughly around about 55 to 60 kilos body weight, and uh, that they are achieving somewhere between about 100 and 150 uh, percent lambing lambs born per use joined, which is the sort of figures we see commercially uh, across the uh, southern Australia. And then if we look at the uh, the other maternal breeds we see here that uh, these are roughly 10 to 15 kilograms heavier on average, and uh, they are also achieving lambs, lambing percentage around about 150 through to 220, 225. And uh, so, if you're trying to produce, uh, these would certainly appear to be the way to go, but it's not telling the whole story in that um, these ewes, by being heavier ewes, obviously require considerably more feed to maintain them. And so you can run less of them. Uh, and I guess the other consideration in the current climate is that um, the value of Merino fleece versus a, a composite or crossbred fleece uh, is um, you know, obviously substantially more, like probably five times more value. So if you're looking at a gross margins analysis, you'd certainly say the Merino is a, a good way to go. Uh, so yeah, I guess the bottom line here is that um, there's probably more to meets the eye in terms of your um, reproductive performance and what you're trying to achieve, whether you're producing prime lambs or a self-replacing flock, as to what uh, direction you're heading. Rightio, so allocating feed resources. Now, normally we say that, um, once again, if you're a self-replacing flock, ideally a lamb down with about three months before the end of the season. So they are lambing onto green feed and uh, that there's lamb, there's green feed there for the... Uh, lambs to be weaned onto. Uh, if you're a prime lamb producer, well, you're probably going to be lambing earlier in the year so that you can turn your lambs off before the, uh, the green feed runs out. So you might be lambing down four to five months uh, prior to the end of the green season. And so obviously your, the length of your season in terms of uh, how long green feed lasts is, will be a large determinant on when the optimum time for you to lamb is. So flexibility and matching uh, feed supply with demand is um, obviously paramount that we really, uh, obviously feed in the paddock is the cheapest to grow and no more so than in the last 12 months. So uh, for example, it might cost you about two cents a kilogram to grow feed in the paddock, whereas it's probably going to cost you 20 or 30 cents 
a kilogram to uh, buy in feed. So what's the benefits of uh, feeding ewes better? So we see here that uh, improving ewe production, uh, you're going to improve wool production quality and uh, you're also improving the fecundity uh, and parity. In other words, the number of lambs conceived uh, per ewe joined. Another benefit is reducing ewe mortality. And uh, so obviously, once again, that has been a, a major issue in the last uh, 12 months, and certainly across Southern Australia. So by having better feed, uh, you reduce the risk of uh, lambing difficulties or dystocia, and uh, you also reduce the risk of pregnancy toxemia. So the illustration here of a, a ewe in late pregnant with very little body fat um, basically uh, succumbed to heterotoxic pregnancy toxemia, should I say, or twin lamb disease, or in this case, uh, triple lamb disease, where they basically run out of uh, energy because it's been a uh, controlled starvation. And so they haven't been getting enough energy to meet the needs of both themselves and the growing fetuses inside. So better nutrition will avoid that. Uh, the next point here is optimising progeny production. So if you're feeding the ewe better, it means that more feed is getting through to the fetus or fetuses, so that'll improve their birth weight, which is fundamental to getting good survival rates. And uh, will also improve from those fetuses as a result of being better fed while they're uh, in utero. And the last point here that um, by feeding the ewe better, um, I guess part of that might be implied is uh, your scanning. So that you're only feeding those ewes that require it. And so those that haven't got um, a pregnancy or for that matter, even those with single pregnancies uh, can afford to be fed less feed uh, without any uh, undesirable effects. So it provides uh, particularly a flexibility if the season collapses. So you're only feeding the ones that really need it the most or feeding most of the ones that need it the most. Ideally, lambing onto green feed. Um, obviously, easier said, not always easy done. Uh, and the reason for that being is that uh, the graph up here illustrates, which is talking about the amount of energy intake. So in the first um, you know, four to six weeks of life, over 50% of the energy that the lamb receives is from milk. And uh, so we re rely on the ewe uh, to be well fed to ensure that they're producing adequate quality and quantity of milk. And uh, so that really necessitates, um, once again, the cheapest feed on offer is going to be green feed when the best quality. And so by having green feed on offer when the ewes are lambing, uh, ensures that they are able to um, meet their requirements in terms of lactation. Uh, and then as the season progresses, obviously lambs are going to be consuming more and more pasture. And so once again, to get good growth rates in lambs to ensure good survival, ideally you need pasture on hand, which uh, we'll talk a bit more about shortly. But um, effectively, uh, when green feed is going to be the best and cheapest source of energy to get your lambs to uh, grow and uh, continue to grow well. So what's their chances of survival? Well, a uh, strong, healthy lamb standing and suckling within 15 minutes of birth is really the gold standard that we aim for. Uh, and they have at least a 90, 95% chance of being alive at weaning. Um, there's the old age that Marina lambs are born to die. Well, that really only comes down to their management largely. And so that if we can ensure that the, the ewe is healthy, uh, in good condition, giving rise to a healthy body weight lamb, uh, there's every reason why they shouldn't better stand up and suckle within 15 minutes of birth uh, and have a very good chance of survival through to weaning and beyond. So this requires you to know the nutritional targets and, and monitor them. And so I've already made mention of the uh, Lifetime U Management Program, which uh, I think is something like 5,000 uh, stock owners around Australia now have undertaken this course. That's a 12 month course, uh, six meetings over 12 months. And uh, so it's all about uh, I guess using your skills in terms of condition scoring the ewes, assessing the pasture and then marrying the two up. And so the illustration here of um, ewes at different condition scores and we always tend to target a ewe that's about score three to be the optimum uh, or the ideal standard for both impro improving ewe and lamb survival but also um, profitability per hectare. And so this is an illustration of one of the groups I ran last year where we've uh, condition scoring 50 ewes at random every six weeks to see how they're progressing and then how, how their uh, energy needs are matching up with what's in the paddock. 
And there is a nice little app here, the LTM app, which is um, free, freely available to anyone who's uh, got a smartphone and can access it. Uh, they've got several little um, video clips here to show you how to use it. So it's a really handy, uh, as is illustrated here, people hold the phone in the hand and, and entering the condition scores as they go and it, it quickly summarises the results after you've done your 50 condition scores. So uh, monitoring condition score to manage um, uh, ULM survival is, uh, is a critical factor. The reason being is that dead ewes don't have lambs. And so this uh, illustration here is highlighting that um, as the condition score, as condition score improves, um, so does ewe survival. So if we've got ewes down here in relatively poor condition, one, one and a half to two score, we see here that um, there's a chance that um, uh, up to 6% of the twin bearing ewes might die and 4% of the, uh, sorry, twin bearing ewes and 4% of the single bearing ewes. Whereas if we can have uh, ewes up here in say score three, we see here that uh, the mortality rate in ewes with single lambs are going to be less than 1%. And uh, the mortality in ewes with twins uh, will also be, uh, will be less than 3%. So that's really what we're targeting. Now these graphs show that sort of imply that as the ewes get um, fatter or in better condition, the uh, mortality rate goes down, but it's not really that, that true so that if you've got animals that are over conditioned which is obviously uh, not very profitable because it means a lot of um, feed has gone into uh, producing fat um, we also hear that see here that as condition score goes up above four that uh, those ewes are also more inclined to die because they uh, tend to be less capable of dealing with any sort of stressful situation so there is a sweet spot here around about three to three and a half where you'll get the optimum use survival and consequently land survival. Uh, this is put neatly in a graph which I've uh, borrowed from the Lifetime U program. So highlighting that uh, if we look at U condition score, ideally they're going to be uh, at three at joining. So this will optimise the egg shed per ovulation or number of uh, ovulations per, uh, that are going to result in potentially a lot more higher twinning rate. Now, if uh, the season is a bit tough, um, these ewes can afford to lose uh, through to the first 90 days or the first three months of pregnancy. But we really need to get them back up into score three uh, prior to lambing here at uh, day 150. And so if we're talking in this situation, say a July lambing, we feed already uh, on offer here. Now it might be uh, not uh, optimum food on offer target, but at least there'll be some Germination by mid-May, which has certainly been the case uh, across South Australia this year, an adequate amount of feed on offer to ensure that uh, the ewes are able to achieve optimum lactation, uh, and so they will get optimum lamb growth rates and lamb survival as well. Now, if you fail to meet these targets, uh, uh, there's three months of uh, green feed ahead of them uh, to get the lambs up to a good uh, growth rate uh, prior to weaning. If you run your ewes heavier than this, uh, that's uh, no dramas, except it's just uh, less efficient because you're actually putting more feed down the throats of uh, the ewes, which uh, probably don't really need it. So you've actually got using 20% 20, 20 more supplement potentially or feed in the paddock. So you're running lower stocking rates as a result of that. Conversely, if you run used to lean, so starting off at two and a half score, going down to nearly two score, it's not recommended because you're likely to get more lamb and ewe deaths as a result of that and certainly if you dip down below score two uh, that's uh, disastrous and so we did see that uh, in some parts of perhaps the lower rainfall areas uh, last year and perhaps again this year that um, ewes that get too leading condition they may lamb successfully but they'll walk away from lamb because they haven't got the uh, the energy to meet both their needs and the lamb so how much is um, when we're assessing food on offer uh, how much is 1,500 kilos? So this is an illustration here of um, you know, a moderately dense pasture with an average height of about five centimetres, which we normally equate to about 1,500 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So that's what we'd ideally like to see uh, when ewes are lambing. So obviously the time of lambing is going to play a critical role into whether, as to whether that much feed is available. The ewes should have on birth weight. So we see here that um, if we say the ideal birth weight somewhere between about four and six kilos. 
So uh, if the user in score three can, well, we'll just uh, actually look at that so if they're in score two condition, in other words, at the bottom end of um, the range, we see here that uh, lambs are likely to only be well, less than three, three and a half kilos at birth. And so a very high chance that they will, won't survive, that they'll probably die in that 48 hour period post lambing, if not before. Whereas if we've got ewes that are in score three condition, uh, more likely, especially if they've got twins, to throw lambs that are about 3.7 kilos or hopefully closer to four. And so we'd expect at least a 70 or 80% survival rate in twins born from a ewe that's in score three or a bit better. Uh, and uh, so that difference in having a ewe at score two at lambing versus score three at lambing probably equates to around about 0.4 of a kilogram in birth weight which can be the difference between death and survival, uh, especially in the case of twins. Uh, conversely, um, with singles, uh, effectively they're more likely to be around about four and a half to five kilograms body weight. And uh, even a U in score two condition can probably give rise to a, a successful birth of a single lamb, whereas it's the uh, condition score is really critical to get these twins to survive. And so talking a bit more about uh, twin survival. So if we actually have a, um, a U in score three condition or more U in score three condition, we're normally targeting around about a 70% survival rate in the twin born lambs and a 90% survival rate in single born lambs. And uh, so we can see here if the U's are in lighter condition that, uh, that survival rate in twins is gonna drop off quite dramatically. So say in score two condition, we'll be lucky to get 50% to survive whereas um, you'll still get 85 plus percent of your single lamb surviving. But the next issue here is talking a bit more about uh, average birth weight and survival. So we see that um, uh, this is a, a lambs alive workshop I did down at Narracourt a couple of years ago where we see uh, we got the producers to bring in dead lambs on the day. We see here there's a proportion that are over or 5.9 or heavier. So these lambs are probably die because of a difficult birth. Uh, just uh, too big for the ewe to push out. There's a proportion here that we're in the good range in that sort of four to, four to five and a half kilos. And uh, so they may have died for other reasons. Uh, and part of the Lambs Alive workshop, we do postmortems to work out why they've died. And then we've got the other uh, proportion of lambs here that are less than three and a half kilos. And so they may have been uh, sing, uh, twins or triplets, or they may have just been a a ewe in poor condition giving rise to a, a small lamb and so um, a much lower chance of survival lambs that are born under about 3.7 kilos in body weight. So we see here that on average um, a ewe giving uh, having twins so you've got a greater than 60% survival if they are um, over 3.7 kilos in birth weight whereas we see with a single born lamb that their chances of survival um, are 90% plus um, if uh, around about five kilos or heavier. So the next issue, once you've got lambs on the ground, is getting to survive, so growth rate is fundamental. And uh, so we see here that food on offer drives lamb growth rate. So we've got lamb growth rate here, 100, 200 plus um, grams per day. And the amount of feed on offer across the bottom. So we on about an average pasture height of uh, five centimetres whereas uh, 2,000 is more like six or seven centimetre average pasture height. But we're also looking at the density of the pasture as well. So if we see here, we've got a, a twin bearing ewe. The ewe is at score two at lambing. So we might be able to get a um, lamb growth rate around about 150, 170. And if we go through to a um, ewe in condition score three, uh, we might be. And so that uh, extra 20 grams a day you know, equates to potentially 600 grams over a month. And so that can be fundamental or critical to that lamb survival. Whereas it's not so critical, obviously, with a single bearing ewe to get that survival, whether they are in score three or, or less. So what's a uh, ewe in score three condition look like? So this is an example of ewes that are approaching lambing and uh, in that ideal score three condition, which is uh, a mob average of score three is when we talk about um, the different benchmarks so that they're in ideal condition for lambing. So what are the causes of lamb loss? So we alluded to um, 
birth weight ready, but um, so there have been several studies looking at uh, lamb loss. And so this one was a Sentinel flock project run in Victoria over a three year period. And uh, the figures here are very similar to what other studies have found where we see that um, starvation and mismothering accounting for nearly two thirds of all the lambs lost. Uh, another 17% here due to difficult birth. And then there was a smattering of other causes from prime percent in this study it was for um, premature or dead in utero. We have uh, ones dying from exposure. So often ones dying from exposure are added in with starvation and mismothering. So that would be um, end up being 65% or two thirds of lambs lost due to exposure or starvation and mismothering. Uh, we have some infectious causes. Uh, there's always going to be some that can't be diagnosed and some that uh, die through misadventure, falling in a dam or getting uh, caught in the fence or whatever. So how do we make some of these diagnoses? So one thing we can do when we're doing lamb postmortems at, uh, so postmorting the lambs at, uh, when they're dead on arrival in that first 48 hours post lambing. So one of the things we can look at here is just by taking the skull cap off, which is pretty simple with a pair of snips, uh, very soft bone. And we can see here that if it, the brain is congested or reddened, uh, that's an indication that it's been a difficult birth or a birth injury. So uh, dystochia, and uh, that can often, or usually predisposes to these lambs dying from starvation, mismothering or exposure. So they may be born alive, but because they've got a brain injury, they don't know to suckle. And uh, so they might wander around for a day or two, depending on how bad the weather is, uh, and end up, end up dying because they never uh, well, they failed to suck because of the, uh, the brain injury. And it's considered in studies going back to the 50s and 60s that probably two thirds of lamb loss may be a result of brain injury or a birth injury, dystochia, uh, which results in them uh, failing to thrive. And so perhaps a lot of people who have kept uh, pet lambs or lambs that have appeared to be... Um, without a mother and they've ended up dying a day or two later and it's usually because they've got a brain injury and so they they just basically uh, disincline to suck uh, and not going to um, survive for long anyway. There are a lot of different causes of lamb loss apart from what we've just highlighted there. So if we just uh, go through and when they occur, so for example, if we talk about nutrition, uh, underfeeding, of course, we've already talked about, may cause uh, loss of embryos early in the birth process. So bearing in mind, this is the... Um, 21 weeks of gestation or otherwise under nutrition in the latter stages can obviously result in both the death of the, uh, the ewe and the lamb, which we commonly refer to as a pregnancy toxemia. Uh, if they've been fed too well, uh, high protein diets, for example, high nitrogen diets in the first few stages, first few couple of weeks of pregnancy can result in the embryo death. And so those usual basically go back and cycle again. And some trace element deficiencies such as selenium can also result in uh, fetal loss early in that um, gestational phase. Then we can have uh, climatic effects. So season may, uh, poor seasons can cause early embryo loss. Uh, high temperatures can certainly cause early embryo loss. Then there's a number of toxins that may be involved. So nitrate poisoning is a classic that um, we tend to see this time of the year when they're on totally green feed and if there's a lot of overcast weather. Um, plants accumulate nitrates and it's not converted into protein. Uh, there's a number of different toxic plants which can cause problems, which we won't dwell on here, and they can cause embryo or fetal loss throughout pregnancy. Uh, onion grass poisoning is another one, or Guilford grass or nut grass uh, can certainly cause em uh, embryo fetal loss during pregnancy. And then we come down to a number of microbial or infectious conditions, which um, several of which we don't have um, in South Australia. Uh, and interesting enough, apart from border disease or pestivirus, which can cause loss throughout pregnancy, most of these um, infectious causes of uh, lamb loss occur in the last third of pregnancy. So if you're seeing abortions in that latter stages of pregnancy, that's um, infectious causes, bacteria, and viruses are certainly something that we'd be uh, worried about or concerned about. So that just highlights that there's a lot of different things that are waiting there to cause lamb loss. Uh, another one is milk fever, uh, which we do see more commonly than we'd like to. And this is where the ewe uh, runs out of calcium in the latter stages of pregnancy. 
And uh, so results in a ewe becoming very somblant or recumbent and after a day or two may die. And usually, um, well, often these animals can have twins, uh, but maybe singles. And uh, you can see here, they've got plenty of fat at them. So it's not actually an energy problem such as pregnancy toxemia, but it's more a case of lack of calcium. So this can occur when you're doing lots of grain feeding uh, without providing a calcium supplement such as lime, uh, where you're grazing green crops or lush grass without providing a calcium supplement. And any stress in that last four weeks pre-lambing can also result in lamb loss. Uh, it's also more prevalent in older ewes because they're less able to absorb and retain calcium in their body. Typical signs, dull and depressed, become go down, become recumbent, become inappetent, and die after a, a few days if not treated with um, the following. So treatment involves giving of a, a flow pack or a min ball or a calcigol. Uh, four in one is another name for it under the skin and perhaps a couple of times a day. And also oral calcium is uh, really important to build those calcium levels back up. And these animals can respond quite rapidly if they're given calcium, if they're at this stage where they're recumbent uh, or just looking a bit somnolent. And prevention involves providing calcium uh, and or magnesium salt mixes for the last eight weeks of pregnancy. Uh, vitamin A, D and E injections four weeks before lambing can also be useful and those last four weeks because any sort of stress is going to predispose. So that's another cause of uh, both you and lamb loss. So improving lamb survival, we don't want this situation. This was a particularly bad uh, weather pattern when lambs were being born, but we do want to see this, obviously uh, lots of twins. So Looking at uh, ewe and uh, lamb survival, so this uh, illustration here is highlighting that um, we can talk about low, medium and dense lambing patterns uh, and the survival rates. So we see here that um, regardless of whether you've got 16, 32 or 48 lambs being born uh, from single born, from single pregnancies, you can tend to get quite good survival rates. So it comes back to lambing density, not about stocking rate per se. Um, but if we look at ewes with twins, you see here that um, as you go from low to high density lambing, we see that the survival rates uh, can drop off by 20%. So optimally uh, with a low lambing density, we're hoping to get you know, 80 plus percent survival in twin, uh, twin bearing ewes. Whereas if we've got a high lambing density and uh, that survival rate can drop off quite dramatically. So how do we, um, how do these figures arise? So if we talk about um, in a normal circumstance with fertile rams and fertile ewes cycling, uh, when the rams go in, you should get about two thirds of the ewes mated in the first cycle, which is roughly 17 days. So two thirds of ewes get pregnant in that first cycle, provided you've got fertile rams and we only need one and a half percent uh, to achieve that. If they've uh, been inspected and fit for purpose. So if we've got a 200 twin bearing ewes in a mob, uh, that will equate to about eight lambs a day, or eight lambings a day, which equates to 16 lambs a day, which is considered a, um, a low density lambing. So you should be able to achieve 80 plus percent uh, lamb survival rate. But if you've got a, a bigger mob of ewes, so for example, 500 twin bearing ewes in a mob, that equates to about 19 lambings a day or 38 lambs a day, uh, all being twins. So we have a high lambing density and this is where we tend to get a lot of mismothering uh, and uh, so much lower survival rates in those uh, twin bearing ewes and lambs. In cream survival, as we've already highlighted, most uh, losses are due to starving, starvation, mismothering or, or hypothermia or what we call um, exposure. Uh, predation is generally less than 10%. Now I'm aware of individual situations where foxes or eagles or significant problem in certain areas, but as a general rule, predation, especially primary predation, where they actually attack a live lamb, is uh, relatively uh, unusual. Uh, they often pick out the, the weak ones or the dead ones rather than, which um, often we call attack. Uh, dystocia, as we highlighted, can be important. Uh, and generally, if we've got the use in score three or better, uh, we're aiming for around about 90% survival in singles and 70% in twins. How do we manage twin lambing use then? So um, strategic feeding of a, a twin bearing use, 
uh, ideally selecting ewes on their ability to rear limbs. Uh, that's perhaps a bit more of a, a genetic issue, which uh, we could talk about another time. Maintaining mob sizes of uh, 200 or less twin bearing ewes, or for that matter, 150 in the case of maiden ewes. Uh, ensure that we do have good predation control, and that's usually a district issue, not really an individual issue, because you don't, um, if you're not everyone, if everyone's not controlling predators, they tend to be uh, come back a bit like flies. Uh, and the next one here is providing good shelter. So plantations, for example, the benefit extends 10 times the height of the plantation or 10 times beyond the height of the plantation. So quite beneficial. Work done down at Hamilton just showing that even having a uh, full wheat grass or cutting grass here, uh, you can increase survival rates by you know, eight to ten percent in twins and three to four percent in singles just by cutting down the wind speed at uh, lamb height. So quite advantageous. Another issue here is avoiding high risk paddocks. So those paddocks that have got southern slopes, which tend to uh, be cold and dank, don't dry out as quickly, and uh, also bare windswept flats, which is obviously um, quite contrary to this, uh, where you're likely to get much higher death rates. So the benefits of improving lamb survival. So just uh, finishing up here, uh, we see that uh, the impact of lamb survival rates on lambs marked from ewes scanned in lambs. So if there's 125% uh, potential lambing based on ewes scanning, uh, we see here that um, using uh, conventional results where uh, commonly achieved 50% of twins of 100 ewes joined, take out nine that may not have got in lamb, You've got 57 singles, you've got um, 46 lambs marked out of those with an 80% survival rate. And then if you've got 34 ewes scanned in lamb with twins, that's 68 lambs, but with a 50% survival rate gives you 34. So the total lambs marked out of 100 ewes is going to be 80. Uh, and the overall lamb survival is actually 6 cents. Now, if we can run those ewes in better condition than twins, going through the mathematics again, we end up with 100% lambs marked, or an 80% overall lamb survival. So uh, perhaps commonly achieved figures here uh, with use may not be 100% totally marked, whereas we uh, have used in ideal condition, we can expect more like a total 100% uh, lambs marked. Now that's with a, um, shall we say, a modest uh, uh, scanned in lamb result. Now many... Uh, Merino producers are achieving more like 150, 160% scanned in lamb, and obviously much higher in other breeds. And so if we go through those sums again, we see that um, a common rate uh, with a higher scanned in lamb, so a bit better twin survival, better single survival, we get 110% lambs marked or 69% overall lamb survival. Or if we can really up the ante and get 95% survival in singles, 85% survival in twins, uh, we see here that um, you can end up with a total of 140% lambs marked or an overall 88% survival rate. And these figures are being achieved by um, a good merino producers. And of course, uh, certainly these figures can be bettered by um, some of the other maternal breeds. So key uh, messages from what we've just talked about for the last half an hour. Uh, so managing the food and offer and new nutrition to achieve uh, condition score targets providing shelter to reduce that wind speed at lamb height uh, and also a chill factor to get better survival rates, focusing on getting survival of your twins and triplets to improve lamb survival rates or lamb percentages, restricting mob size so that you minimise mismothering and so obviously get better uh, lamb survival rates, uh, preventing dystochia by improving ewe nutrition, uh, as well as, um, which I haven't covered off here, but selecting size with Moderate, moderate lambing birth weights, so using uh, Australian sheep breeding values to select for size with moderate birth weight. We don't want small birth weights because that just means they're going to be uh, uh, perhaps a lower growth rate and take uh, and probably not achieve ideal uh, weaning weights. And the last point here is uh, focus on, is on lamb birth weight to increase survival. So ensuring that those lambs are at least three. 0.7 to 4 kilograms at birth to um, optimise their survival, chance of survival. 
So the question is, how will you increase your marking percentage? Now, I appreciate that it will depend on where you're at with your landing at this point in time, but um, hopefully there's quite a few um, pointers there to think about and, uh, and perhaps take into consideration next year if, uh, if not possible this year. So some of the courses that are available for improving um, or opportunities to improve lamb survival, so lifetime U management certainly focuses on that. Uh, there's lifting lamb survival, uh, rather than new course that's been released in the last 12 months, uh, which is focusing on a lot of the points I've just raised here. Ramping up repo, which is obviously focusing on rams to get um, good fertility and better lambing uh, can rates. More lambs more often is another course looking at uh, opportunities to produce more lambs. Lambs Alive, which I referred to before, which is uh, a one-day workshop looking at how we do lamb post-mortems. So giving you pointers on how to um, identify the cause of lamb loss and so that's useful information in terms of what you might do or change management the following year. And then there's uh, winning, winning with weaners which is focusing on more on the lamb survival from weaning through that first 12 months. There's also information available through the websites, MLA and AWI websites. And for example, making more from sheep, uh, module 10 is all about um, wean more lambs also. So there's a lot of information out there, but um, Certainly, uh, perhaps get on to uh, Sheep Connect if you would like to follow up with any, any of these courses and uh, they're certainly advising when courses are on as they did before um, this presentation. So thank you for listening and uh, I'd like to now hand back to Jody and uh, see if there are any questions. Thanks, Colin, for a great presentation. Um, I've got several questions that have come in, um, but if, you, if you've got a question, please type it into your Q&A box and, and send it through, um, and I'll um, ask them as time allows. So, Colin, the first one we had um, refers to at the beginning of your presentation about you weight or condition score. So, which one is it that has a greater effect on conception rates? Uh, definitely you condition score. And the reason being that uh, condition is a euphemism for fat. And uh, so we, not, we like to, uh, fat is an energy store and it's really the energy that the animal's got on board, which is critical to uh, both better conception rates and then through to better lamb survival or fetal, fetuses survival and then better milk production. So you wait, I mean, you can actually have a 60 or 70 kilogram animal, which is actually uh, skin and bone. So if they're a big framed animal with a big gut on them, uh, they may not have much fat. And so it's the energy reserves which really dictate um, or determine the chances of lamb survival or fetal survival. So, yeah, that's why we really focus on what you can do with your hands. You can just feel the, the amount of fat over the loin or the short ribs um, between the rib cage, the thoracic rib cage and the hips. So feeling the amount of fat over the eye muscle and the um, spinous processes there uh, is a good indicator of the how the animal's feed situation has been over the last four weeks uh, and a very useful tool for determining if um, their energy needs are being met. Obviously, if they're losing condition, well, then we need to look at um, what's uh, in front of them in terms of feed in the paddock or supplements to ensure that they retain that score three or better. Excellent. Thanks for that. The next question comes in is about how far out from lambing does the feed demand for singles versus twins um, come into effect? So when you need to split those mobs or feed them differently? Okay. Um, yes. So look, I guess from the day they're scanned, and that's usually around about six weeks after the rams went in, uh, sorry, six weeks after the rams come out or six or 12 weeks after the rams went in, in other words, around about day 80 of pregnancy uh, is when we like to scan. And thereafter, uh, we probably focus on what their condition score is about that time or through to day 100. And uh, the condition score there really determines how they're going to progress through to lambing at day 150. And uh, we really need to ensure that the twin bearing ewes are getting more nutrition in that last six weeks because that's when most of the fetal growth is occurring. So after day 100, um, we really would like to divide them up into um, single and twin bearing mobs and ensure that the uh, twin bearing mobs are getting the uh, extra energy to ensure they can uh, maintain their score three condition through to lambing. Uh, whereas the single bearing ewes, if times are tough, I mean, they can afford to uh, 
perhaps lose a bit of the condition if, if need be, but ideally keep them in the same condition. But uh, they will still give birth to a single lamb uh, under less ideal conditions than a twin bearing ewe. Thanks for that one. Another one, um, considering conditions this year where we've still got some low pasture levels, should we be considering early weaning? Uh, yes, uh, bearing in mind that um, we normally recommend weaning at 12 to 14 weeks of age. Uh, and the reason being that um, at that stage, assuming a five or six week joining, it means the youngest lambs will be sort of six to eight weeks of age. And it really takes at least six weeks for the um, rumour and the lamb's rumen to develop to the extent where it can operate independently on dry feed or green feed, whatever the case may be. But um, we really need the, the youngest lambs to have a well-developed rumen. So then that really does take about six weeks. So ideally your youngest lambs are going to be around about six to eight weeks of age. Uh, and so the oldest lambs are going to be um, 12 to 14. So when we talk about early weaning, we're probably uh, saying that the bare minimum is that your youngest lambs really do need to be at least uh, six weeks of age. Uh, generally, we'd argue that uh, lambs will, for the first one or two weeks, will be on a totally milk diet, and then they'll start nibbling on dry feed. Now, in a tough time, I mean, they probably do start nibbling on dry feed uh, earlier than that. But uh, so we'd normally say six weeks of eating hard feed. Uh, and they should have a sufficiently developed rumen that they can then be weaned uh, successfully. Thank you. Um, and we might finish off with this last question, Colin. There's a question here about, is there a benefit to lamb survival with ewes having short wool um, for winter lambing? And does this actually affect the ewes' behaviour, like taking them to shelter or something else? Yeah. If we... Uh, Focus on merinos, which are probably, uh, I guess, have got the reputation for being the poorest mothers. Uh, we do find that um, even if they are shorn, say, four weeks before lambing, uh, they probably don't tend to seek out shelter all that effectively. And so that's why it's important that you actually have adequate shelter in the lambing paddock. Uh, of course, you've got to be wary of predators as well, but... Um, uh, basically having sufficient shelter there that the ewes can't avoid but use it. So we would normally say that ideally they shouldn't have any more than six months of wool on them at lambing because obviously if there is a lot of wool hanging around the udder, um, uh, that can be uh, obstructive, I guess, to lambs um, uh, finding the, the udder and the teats. Uh, the other issue, is, of course, is if there's a if they're daggy or they've got you know some scars or whatever that obviously creates a bit of a health hazard for lambs too um, is another consideration but uh, so ideally less than six months of wool um, around the udder and, and uh, breech area but um, yeah we generally find that even if they've been shorn uh, in the last four weeks prior to lambing that it doesn't necessarily seem to improve their um, seeking out shelter to obviously improve lamb survival so it's probably more a case of having paddocks with adequate shelter so that um, you don't, they don't necessarily have to seek it out. Excellent. Actually, um, Colin, I'm going to sneak one more question in. Um, the question's come in about culling ewes based on um, failing to rear a lamb um, or if a ewe needs some assistance. Does that help with your lambing percentages going forward? Uh, certainly can do. Now, we consider that reproductive performance in sheep is uh, moderately heritable. Now, it's around about 0.2 to 0.25 or 20, 25%. And so by selecting for ewes that, um, for example, if you always select ewes that have had twins, uh, you'll certainly see an increase in reproductive performance over time. Uh, and, and so uh, conversely, by pulling out ewes that have held the lamb, lambed and lost, so if by one you can see which ewes actually uh, don't have another at all and so probably didn't lamb, or that have had another that has, hasn't been sucked recently or has got no milk in it, um, that probably lambed and lost. But uh, as a general rule, most producers will probably give a, a ewe a second chance if they've uh, failed to get in lamb or if they've lambed and lost. But if you really want to be, um, uh, I guess, uh, harsh, um, any ewe that doesn't raise a ram uh, could be cold, a lamb could be cold. Uh, it also depends, obviously, um, you don't want to jeopardise your stocking rates um, with a harsh culling policy. So there's probably two schools of thought there. I think most people probably do give ewes a second chance, especially younger ewes, if they've um, failed to rear a lamb. 
but certainly by doing scanning and pulling out those that have failed to get in lamb and uh, they can be run as effectively as weathers. Or uh, the other aspect is doing wet and drying at marking time and pulling out those ewes that have failed to rear a lamb. So um, people will usually tag those and, and perhaps make a decision about whether they'll give them another chance or whether they, I, I guess they can lose a lamb uh, through no fault of their own, but it may also indicate that they're not a very good mother. So. Um, it depends how harsh you want to be there, but um, I guess the other critical thing from a, um, a profitability point of view is you don't want to um, cull a whole lot of sheep and end up with a low stocking, stocking rate so, because it's all about um, uh, lamb, meat and wool produced per hectare rather than the individual. Thank you so much for answering those um, questions that have come in. Um, I'd like to thank all our listeners for joining us today for our webinar. Colin, thank you so much for sharing your insight and expertise with us. Um, if any of our listeners should have additional questions or um, would like to connect directly with the Sheep Connect SA team, please contact us either through the email that you got confirming your attendance at the webinar or through the Sheep Connect website, or you can email one of us. Um, thank you for your time and have a wonderful evening. There will be a quick poll at the end of the um, webinar, which um, we would love you to fill in. But thank you so much. We'll catch you in a couple of weeks for another thank webinar. You.